Erica Hanna, <clears throat> a small business owner of Pew Rainbows. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we met originally through, I believe it was Twitter. Yes, Twitter. Tweet and meet, I think. Tweet and meet. That's mm -hmm. what it was. Yep. And I was super interested in learning about what she was doing, where she was working at the time, and I just engaged in a conversation and I tried to not make it super awkward because sometimes I have the ability to do that. Hey, same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> super awkward here. Yep. Yeah, and then from there we, so I, I don't, I've known her for the past, are we going in like seven years? Probably. Seven? Yep. Okay. Yep. Maybe closer to eight, whatever. Seven, eight years, close yeah. enough. I wanted to bring her on camera today because I think that she has a lot of value to add from Aww. video. I mean, she's been doing this for 20 years. Yeah, since I was like four years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm obviously older than Rachel, so. Uh, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> so we'll start off with 21 questions just to kind of, you know, have a little bit of fun. Do and we then, do 21 shots with the questions? Like, is that a thing? I don't know. Or oh, that's a different show. That's called My Drunk Kitchen. That's right. With Hannah Hart. Yeah, she's fabulous. She's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like her. She's really great. I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. Go check out Hannah Hart. She's yeah. Right. yeah. The other Hannah. The other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's, let's do this. Okay. <laughs> okay. First piece of video equipment you ever owned. Whoa, man. I'm trying to even think. I don't even think I owned video equipment because, so background, we were really poor when I was a kid. So we actually, first piece, yep, okay, first piece of, piece of video equipment I used, I guess you could say was a VCR, but the VCR was actually shared between all three of the brothers, like my dad, his, and his two brothers, and we would take it in three month stints because it was like, we couldn't afford a VCR. So okay. we would get to borrow it from grandpa for three months at a time. Like, and it was like a big deal. I was like, oh my gosh, yes. Now we're gonna watch things on the VCR for three months and woo, you know, yeah. So that's how it began. Like, fun. Yeah, it was, it was like something to look forward to. The days of the VCR. The VCR. And then we bought a rewinder and we thought we were like high tech. Do you, you have to mind? buy? Like, oh, you, could, you could buy a high speed rewinder because I don't know if you remember this, but when if a VCR, if you were rewinding it, it would take forever. forever. And so we bought a, a high speed like rewinder for like $9, I think. And it was like, you put it in and five minutes later it'd be all rewound and you're like, yeah, we're the best. That didn't waste any time. And you take oh it back to the video store, borderline pizza and video in four city, <laughs> Iowa. Ah, that is amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> so there, that's your high tech answer. Woo. Yep. All right. <laughs> Favorite lunch spot. Favorite lunch spot currently? Yeah. My kitchen because my, of course, my partner and boyfriend is a personal chef, the Dapper Chef on Facebook. Yes. Plug. Yeah. Plug. He makes wonderful food. Okay. And I love him so much. <laughs> uh, left or right? Uh, right. Okay. What's one conference that's on your bucket list to speak to this year? Uh, well, this year would be hard because like conferences usually book out like a year ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So I would love to attend and or speak at the Aspen Ideas Festival. That would just be incredible. Canon or Sony? Canon for sure. Yeah. Pet peeve. Oh man. People that drive in the left lane and don't get over for you on the interstate. Like that's my, I rage. I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you sitting there in the left lane and blocking traffic or people that don't know how to zipper merge and then they like flip you the bird or they like get over on the shoulder and almost cause an accident because they don't understand traffic rules. You're like, no, the zipper merge is how it goes. Let people in. Yes. You know? so. Yes. In one word, being a small business owner is? Being a small business owner is freedom. There you go. Favorite vacation spot? My favorite vacation spot so far has been uh, Sedona, Arizona. Um, which is just red rocks. It's beautiful. It's a couple hours from the Grand Canyon and it's also kind of small town feel-ish so you can walk around and um, 
I don't know, the views and the sunsets are just amazing and it's dry heat and it's beautiful. Yeah. What's one brand you're loyal to? I would say it's not necessarily their brand, but it's an organization, Charity Water. Mm -hmm. I've you know, I'll buy stuff from their store that I don't necessarily need because they're a nonprofit that I support and I'll be like, Oh, I think I need that t shirt because I <laughs> Because I'm helping somebody. <laughs> I'm helping somebody. Right. And I love it and their branding is awesome, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Pia, she's raised thirty thousand dollars for charity water. I so. love them. They're yeah. great. <laughs> but they're they're really good. Yeah. Uh, favorite season. I like fall because all the colors of the leaves and also sweatshirts. Although I have to say, I think I'm the only person on the planet that the smell of bonfires kind of makes me like go like Bleh, no I hate it and I don't know so okay. that makes me not a Minnesotan I guess because everyone's like I can't wait for the smell of bonfire and if I'm at a bonfire and I wake up the next day I'm just like oh god it just stinks so bad like I hate it the one thing about bonfires for me is that I have to it's the equivalent of going to a bar mm. if it's out of state if I go to a bar where there's smoke in there. It, it doesn't matter what time of the day it is when yeah. I get back home, whether it's 11 o'clock or for whatever reason, 2 a.m. because I'm yeah. maybe out for a party and I somehow was able to withstand Rachel. being out till 2 Doing all your 21 <laughs> shots. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to take a shower. Yeah. Because otherwise everything reeks mm -hmm. of bonfire or the smoke. Yeah. yeah. I have to take a shower. So from that standpoint, I completely get it. Completely understand that. Yeah. Favorite color? Mm. Blue, like a royal blue. Mm -hmm. How many external hard drives do you own? Uh, probably like 15. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I tend to go smaller hard drives. Um, this was advice from a buddy of mine. He's like, do smaller hard drives with less projects on them because then if one of them bites the dust, you don't lose everything. And then I always put each project on at least two hard drives. Um, of different brand because um, if you buy you know like 10 hard drives of the same brand they're gonna probably all die around the same time mm -hmm. you know and um, so yeah I always put one on each brand of hard drive <laughs> like learn the hard way <laughs> I do the same exact thing I'll purchase about a year and a half to two years mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. so I'll buy one and then wait and then buy another mm -hmm. one so that right yeah it's yeah so I hear what you're clucking is what I'm yeah, trying to say. Yeah, you're picking up what I'm putting down? Yeah! What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> book or Kindle? Audiobook. Audiobook. Can I do that? Can yeah. I like, yeah, yeah. I, I love listening. Um, listening like calms me down. As long as it's someone decent who's reading. Because I think we've all listened to an audiobook where it's the author and you're like, why? There's some people that should not do that that are writers yeah. and, and they should hire someone else to yes. have the, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hire me to read your audiobook. I would love to. Or hire me to read your audiobook. There you go. There you go. Well, now it's a competition, so thanks a lot, Rachel. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> What's a podcast you're keen on? I love uh, Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income podcast, which is funny because I don't have like a lot of passive income that's not really my thing you know I'm I do affiliate links through Amazon if I recommend gear but I think I've made like sixty dollars like <laughs> through all time yeah. you know yeah. so um, but for some reason I just I love Pat Flynn because I think he does a great job of I mean he's friends with Gary Vaynerchuk and, and, and I love Gary and he's great but Pat Flynn does a little bit better job of showing like that work-life balance and um, encouraging people to get that work-life balance and that it's doable. I like that about him and he also dives into so many different online marketing topics that even if you're not applying it to passive income, it applies to any business. So I just, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a Pat Flynn fangirl after I saw him speak at the lead pages event that was here two years ago. Okay. He's just very charismatic. Okay. How do you get your daily news? Um, <laughs> well, 
I can't really escape my daily news, I guess I would say, because I worked in a TV station, for, or I worked in television for more than a decade. So that means that over half of my Facebook friends are newsies. <laughs> so they're always posting news. <laughs> that and, makes sense. and I can't really escape it. Um, but if I turn off all social media, then I'm definitely an NPR, NPR girl. One thing you can't leave the house without. Mm, man. One thing I can't leave the house without is <laughs> my Mophie charger pack for my cell phone. <laughs> because my iPhone drains pretty quick and then I'm, yes. and, and then as a business owner, if I don't have my phone with me, I'm just kind of out of luck and I can't, there's no way to explain that to a client. You know, I couldn't right. get to you because I was playing a game on my phone and it went dead, you know? Like, that's just not gonna happen. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I need to figure out what you have and if it's, if it's, yeah. Apple, if it works with the, the droid that I've got, mm -hmm. cause mm -hmm. your, your battery lasts all day then. Mm-hmm. Yep. All day. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Scariest thing you've done video-wise? Video-wise? Wow. Um, well, there's so many things actually that come to mind, I guess. Uh, scariest thing I've done video-wise is two. One, um, working with Prince was terrifying. Uh, I, I was terrified and I thought I was gonna throw up on him and that's a whole other story. And <laughs> It's a good story. If you've got like 10, 15 minutes in America, <laughs> seriously, ask her because I, your job will drop. Oh God. It's, it's the most, uh -huh. Even your gut is like wrenching for you as you're telling the story, <laughs> okay. but there is a happy ending to it. There's definitely a happy ending to it. So it was it was a great experience. And then like, actually, the second most scary video thing I did was working with Liz Winstead, who is the co-creator of the Daily Show, and has always been kind of like a idol of mine. She's a female writer. She's super funny, and. Um, I was asked to be the uh, production manager for her uh, live show. And at the time, when I did this a couple of years ago, I had kind of said to myself, like, I am a company that will never do live video. I'm never ever gonna do live video. And she was like, do you ever do live video? And I was like, I can, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, and, and I knew that it was, it was, we were basically doing an as live and then a little bit of edit and post and turn it around within 24 hours, but it was fun. It was really fun. And, um, yeah, but I think I heard a quote the other day, something like, if you're not a little bit scared when you say yes to something, then you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, that's kind of what I'm living by this year. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. One thing you're really looking forward to in 2018, even though we've been in this year now for like six weeks. Yeah, so one thing I'm really looking forward to in 2018 is expanding, um, well, one, learning. Because I'm taking a lot of the presentations I do and I'm translating them into webinars and online courses, which for me is really, really terrifying. <laughs> I don't know. Just because it's a space I don't usually play in and it's that whole like, ooh, what if no one wants to watch it? What if nobody wants to buy it? Like, you know, imposter syndrome like creeps up again and yeah. you're like, oh, I don't know. This is a new thing. And so, um, but I also forget, I forgot until recently because I'm so used to working in a space where I'm um, considered an expert, I guess, that I forget that when you're pushed out of your comfort zone, it's liberating because you're like frustrated and then you're like I did it you know yes. and then you want to do it again you want to try other things yeah and yeah so it's been great learning you know all those different platforms for the things and yeah it's so so fun west or east coast it kind of depends on what I want to do right mm -hmm. so I uh, a friend of mine once said um, the first question you're asked on the East Coast is what you do for a living, and the first question you're asked on the West Coast is if you want to drink. <laughs> Which I'm like, that kind of sums it up a little bit. <laughs> so if I wanted to go and chill and be just like, 
you know, relax, I would say West Coast. If I want to go and, um, I actually have some work coming up on the East Coast um, in the next couple of months. And I like the East Coast because it's, you know, fast, everyone's going, yeah. you know, it's like no BS, no whatever, and um, so for different reasons. So I don't know. I, I think that's why I live in the middle. <laughs> Like, you know, so yeah. I never would have thought West Coast get a drink, East Coast. What do you do? Yeah, that's like the perfect way mm -hmm. to explain it. Yeah, in a yeah. really weird way. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because most people say, "Oh, West Coast surfer dudes." And sure. East Coast is all like business. Yeah, yeah. So it's like West Coast is social and East Coast is business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dang. Mm -hmm. Favorite kind of whiskey. Oh, um, favorite kind of whiskey. I like like expensive Glenlivet type of ask. things. Yeah, I was gonna ask if it was like Glenlivet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be it. That would be my choice. Yeah, I obviously don't buy it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> favorite show. Favorite show. Um. Okay, so my favorite show, I have two. One is Scandal. <laughs> I love Scandal. Hello, Jake. Come on, Jake. Be a good guy. Um, and, and that's ending, so I don't know what I'm going to do. But, um, oh, three, I guess. Two, Outlander, which is just like appeals. I don't know. I, the Diana Gavaldon book series is great, and it's based on that, and it's very historically accurate. It's very cool. Um, that's my, like, version of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I, I don't watch Game of Thrones. I watch Outlander. Um, and because, you know, they have Scottish accents, and it's so great. And, um, and then the third one is so random. But my partner found this show called Idiot Sitter on, I think Idiot. it's like Idiot Sitter, like Babysitter, except it's Idiot Sitter on, ne on Netflix. And it's like, if you want to sit down and just watch something that's stupid funny, it's two women that are the main characters, which I love because that never, ever, ever happens. You know, like, I mean, there's statistics about that, that women usually don't talk to each other unless it's about a man in a movie or in a series, right? So I love seeing, it's like two female leads and it's about like this Harvard grad who is trying to help this super rich kind of bratty woman get her act together. And um, together they just, play off each other so well and there's so much like physical humor where just the timing where it'll be like a look a look a look a look a look I just love that I love that kind of humor okay. so it's a little crass I'm not gonna lie but idiot sitter is pretty funny that yeah. sounds hilarious it is it's just like a sit down and zone out and there goes the world like the world is not even <laughs> not worried about anything right now you know like this show is so dumb but so funny <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now we're going to jump to the questions. Okay. You have been working in video, like we mentioned, for 20 years, essentially. Yeah, almost, yeah. Tell me what the capabilities are with Pew Rainbows and the, the type of clients that you are, you know, that, that you take on. Yeah. So Pew Rainbows is a video production and creative company. Um, and the type of clients we take on range anywhere from, you know, Target is a client, uh, Mayo Clinic's been a client. Um, we also work with nonprofits and anyone like that. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're putting videos together and I would say that what I'm usually approached for is uh, people that are looking to either do a brand refresh or just kind of rediscover their story. That's usually who's coming to me, and I think maybe the name of my company kind of self-vets that so that I don't get a lot of super uber corporate stuff because mm -hmm. corporate people are afraid of the word puke, and if they're afraid of the word puke, that's fine because it means they're way too much of a bummer to want to work with. <laughs> like, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So rebranding, in a sense, like you help people... A little bit, or it's like, or like evolve their brand, or bring their brand into video, right? I have um, like a retainer client I'm working with right now that um, they are one of the best web design companies in the world, HubSpot um, web design companies, 
and they don't dabble in video you know they're like we know that websites are our thing mm -hmm. and so I've been consulting with them on how to translate their brand voice into video and it's been so fun yeah okay mm -hmm. I think I know which client you're talking about yeah media junction okay right. I okay said, yep media okay. junction there awesome. I wasn't 100 percent certain so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yep try, try to be respectful of those yeah. things on camera absolutely absolutely you've been a uh, director on set for many many things you brought Ellen generous here we've talked about prints mm -hmm. um, you've worked with University of Minnesota Rochester Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. um, the, the list goes on video is not going away and it never was mm -hmm. and so for someone who wants to get more comfortable on camera you offer you know boot camp classes mm -hmm. and if they go through that class is that when they then decide whether or not they need to hire an internal team um, and if they do decide to go that route what resources do you like what resources are you able to provide for them so that they can go that direction yeah, so the boot camps are geared towards, they have themes. The boot camps have themes. And um, one's a beginner boot camp that's like four hours long. Uh, this one that's coming up on February 22nd is uh, mostly uh, getting comfortable on camera and a uh, live stream, Facebook Live uh, combo camp. And that'll be a little bit shorter. Um, so people are there for a lot of different reasons you know it's like we've had people from GoDaddy come but we've also had people that are like I'm just starting a startup and I'm the only person in my business so um, there's there's definitely a variety of reasons why people are there we've also had you know high marketing directors come and just say like I just want to come because I feel like I'm behind and I don't have enough time to sit down and watch a million YouTube videos and I want to learn from someone who's an expert and be done with it and get caught up with my team <laughs> you know which is great I think um, but as far as internal video goes and resources for internal video um, I think that I mean per if you're talking about personally what I do I uh, like my like my job with Media Junction would be you know it's like I'm advising their internal team that they have um, on what to do with video and I'm working with them and collaborating with them on their video. So, um, and uh, yeah. Great. Two part question here. So emerging someone's self into the world of video can be, it can be pretty uncomfortable. Most people it's daunting. aren't comfortable on camera. Mm -hmm. um, most people have no idea where to even start. I used to be one of those people yeah. and you just said jump and so I jumped and mm -hmm. I made a video and it actually was kind of fun to make and it took a lot of time and yeah. I think you could see you know the production and the development of it and you're like go Rachel and I was like yeah. thank you yeah. <laughs> absolutely so once a business decides that they are going to hire a team what is usually the the common hurdle that you see that they need to jump over so mm -hmm. let's just start with that first um, the biggest hurdle is that they overanalyze everything Right? It's just, um, yes, you need to make sure that it is cohesive with your brand. I understand that. And that is getting, you know, taking your brand style guide and just looking at it and making sure, hey, does the video match, right? Are we using the same colors in our graphics? Are we using the same fonts? Are we, you know, speaking in the same tone of voice that our website speaks in? Uh, great examples. But the big thing is, is that people will, um, put out a, or, or they'll just be like no this isn't everything's not exactly perfect and then they won't put anything out um, but the thing is with social especially now is that our audiences if you're a B2C you know your audience decides what's perfect mm -hmm. and, and even if you put a bunch of stuff out that doesn't get a lot of views that's telling you something, you know, it's telling you that maybe you're concentrating on the wrong thing that your audience isn't even caring about. Mm -hmm. You know, I put out a blog post the other day that was like four tips about what to wear on camera and I was like, whatever, it took me like two seconds to write it. It's been, it's by far like, like four times the amount of views on that blog post than any other blog post I've ever put out. And I'm like, really? Like this has more views than my like, 2018 video trends posts or you know like I mean I don't know I just was really surprised and um, 
never underestimate how self-conscious people are on camera, I guess, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. It, it, a lot of people will dodge or they feel daunted by it, so I, I, mm -hmm. I understand, like, I don't understand because I'm comfortable on camera, yeah. but, I, but I do understand because yeah. it makes our time. Secondly, when I say team, um, mm -hmm. when you're putting together, like wanting to put together a video team, yeah. companies see dollar signs, and sure. sometimes they see a lot of dollar signs. So, where do you think that companies hold back? And based on your boot camp classes that you've, you know, provided, sure. that the feedback that you've received from those classes, where do companies? hold back as far as investing in video? Yeah. Um, I would say usually they're really slow to invest in, um, it just depends on the company, but I'd, I'd say a lot of companies are really slow to invest in equipment, and that's because the people that they're switching over to video don't necessarily know what they're looking for and don't know how to use it. So I think it's okay to be slow with that, right? And that's why I do the boot camps about smartphones because depending on the workflow that companies are looking for, um, you know, if they're just looking to do social media videos like every other day, the workflow on an iPhone is great compared to a DSLR, um, especially if you're working with somebody who's never edited before. You know, editing on a really quick app is a lot easier on right. a phone. Um, so that learning curve is not quite as steep. Um, but you know, I have a lot of clients that I talk to that I've actually done these training camps for them and then I also am hired to do their higher level image stuff because they're like, we look at it as, yeah, cool, you empowered us to be able to do daily stuff and then with that daily stuff we can collect a lot of data about what resonates with our audience and then when we find what resonates with our, with our audience, then we invest in a big crew to make something that just like blows it out of the water, which which feels great, you know. Okay. So okay. yeah. You have a brand vibe with video and you focus on helping companies sell their product, which can require you know, it can require a whole production set. I mean you have you have lighting, you have sound, you have makeup, and one of the people that you introduced me to, probably I think it was three years ago now, Casey Neistat, mm -hmm. it cost him zero dollars mm -hmm. because he decided to invest in the equipment. Mm -hmm. And then there is also Gary Vaynerchuk who for his for his videos, that's costing him anywhere from a hundred thousand dollars a year to even two hundred thousand dollars a year, depending yeah. on the type of project he's he's doing. So my point here is is that everyone has a style. Mm -hmm. And when someone asks how high do you jump and you literally say just start should businesses formulate a plan to help themselves ease into the, the medium to and and pay attention to how they're using it from a vibe standpoint yeah I mean I think that it is always important to keep your brand in mind whenever you're doing anything new mm -hmm. um, because I don't know how many times I've seen a brand that's you know super serious and then the person who's assigned the video is like the intern and they try to make this super really funny quirky video and then it just doesn't work with the brand and it feels like it's a completely different company and um, yeah that can be an issue so sometimes with the companies I'm working with uh, will you know, work together to put together a video brand style guide for them just so that they have like a jumping off point. Mm -hmm. And that's even something as simple as, you know, this is the type of framing we really like because it's the type of framing we use in our photos on our website. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the vibe the video has to have. We want it to be, um, you know, maybe a little sarcastic but not snarky. And so we'll, we'll make lists of words and, and sometimes even just have those, have people carry them with them, you know, like keep these things in mind as you're on video, you know, you're enthusiastic, but you're not theatrical, you know, like that type of, that type right. of stuff. So right. yeah, I do think it's important. And I also think it helps people be a little bit less nervous because when you're starting with a new concept of anything, you're like, oh my gosh, all the things. Mm -hmm. But if you're narrowed down a little bit and told, we're, okay, we need a testimonial video that is conversational and approachable 
and has just some good information in it, then you're like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna research how to do those videos, I'm gonna go do those videos, like, it's narrowed down for me and I feel more confident now. Yeah, okay. so. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of hearing you saying that it might already be, that the formula might already be in the things that you're doing yeah. from a, a photo standpoint. Mm -hmm. Just bring it to life using video. Absolutely, and one of the things that I love to do, um, one, because I'm not a great graphic designer, is use organic elements as end plates or as um, the graphic end plates for stuff. So, you know, I was doing uh, some work with a bank down in Iowa last weekend and uh, they didn't have their graphic designer on staff and I was like, yeah, but look at all the swag that you guys already have. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing, you're doing this online video series, why wouldn't you use this mouse pad that's brand new that has your logo on it and like shoot that from above and just have someone mousing over the logo at the end and like that's your end plate and then you can put annotations on your YouTube video like visit us wherever but then you don't have to rethink you know don't reinvent the wheel if you have stuff that looks amazing already right so, yeah right mm -hmm. yeah that's I think that's the key don't reinvent the wheel because mm -hmm. I think that's what people yeah tend to tend to think when they think video mm -hmm. It's like you have so many things at your disposal already mm -hmm. that could enhance your video. Mm -hmm. Just Agreed. need to look for them. <laughs> Agreed. How do you know when your audience is engaging? And I want to add a little bit of context to this. You talk about ROE, mm -hmm. and most people know it, know it as return on engagement, mm -hmm. but you say return on enthusiasm. Yeah. And I think that that's I think that that's awesome. So. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so two different ways, I guess. Um, the first way would be if um, by audience you mean socially. Uh, I would say that return on engagement, engagement is traditionally known as a like, a share, or a comment. Um, I would say return, return on enthusiasm is when those people turn into brand advocates and they're sharing everything, you know, and they're like, they are just like blasting you, you know, they're totally enthusiastic. And then on the other side of things, if you're talking about internally, um, so many times we were like, oh shoot, we need to do video, but we can't hire anyone new, right? Mm -hmm. And the suggestion I usually have then is, well, instead of just taking the youngest person on staff, because that's a lot of times the people will be like, I bet, I bet Joey's good at video because he's a kid and has a phone, you know, and it's not always the case, mm -hmm. right, you know. Um, but, I mean, oftentimes it's like the mom in the room who's used to videoing her kids already and like used mm -hmm. to rounding people up and she's used to producing already, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, what I love to tell people that, that are like, okay, how do I figure out who I should give a video? I say, well, give a workshop and then observe and see who's actually excited about it yeah. because that's who the person sh should be in your organization that's doing it because if you just if you assign it to someone else who you think should be doing it and if they hate it chances are you'll lose that employee and they're going to become bitter because they're just like no i don't i don't want to do this you know mm -hmm. so let somebody do it that'll run with it and have fun there you go yeah you're never gonna get it right with video. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk to me about like maybe a testimony about a client that um, you've helped get over the hump? As far as finding their voice and, and finding something, like getting it right? You know? Yeah. Um, I know it's kind of a, <sighs> it's kind of a tough question to ask because it's, but yeah. I, I figured you've had so many encounters and yeah absolutely so one one that comes to mind is um, as far as getting it right when it comes to video is I think sometimes that return on investment is an indication if it was right or not right mm -hmm. and one group that I completely loved working with um, one of my actually my first client um, when I was out of the gate and I had jumped mm -hmm. was Tonic Solfa and um, and Sean Johnson's big band experience. Two different bands, and Sean Johnson is in both of them, and amazing. Um, Tonic Sofa had done a Kickstarter video a couple years prior to, and it had taken a long time to get to their goal, okay. right? And 
they had since been putting in lots of work with social, and I will give them 100% credit with that, that they were building social credit with their audience, talking back to them a lot, and, and they were getting used to them being engaged. Mm -hmm. And so when they called me to do a Kickstarter video, I was like, oh, this is perfect. It's like the perfect storm because your audience is already engaged, mm -hmm. but they haven't seen any really um, super high-end video from you guys since maybe your PBS special, you know, like five, five eight years ago, mm -hmm. you know? So this is perfect. And um, we narrowed down what they were really trying to say. We left some of the outtakes in there because their their audience loves them being silly and um, just really spoke from the heart. And we saw their Kickstarter campaign made its goal, I want to say just a few days in, you know? Whereas the first time around, it took forever, you know? And this time it was like, done, you know? Yeah. And they were like, whoa, that was so great. We're so excited. Oh my gosh, yay. And like, we didn't have to, you know, like, and I'm like, well, that's also you guys because you're doing social much better now, so I can't take full credit for it. Yeah. But a lot of people were like, oh, we love this video. We really, like, we want to share it because it shows, like, how professional you guys are and it shows, like, how wonderful you guys sound and just who you are as people. And, and that was really rewarding. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yay. They, they make beautiful music. They do. They're great people, too. So, yeah. And then I had never heard of them previous to Erica, so props, yeah. props to Erica. For yeah. I mean, they're Emmy Award winners, they, you know? Like, they're as is somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, they're great. Uh, if you like acapella music, for sure, check out Tonic Sulfa. Boop, boop. Yep, yep. For live streaming at conferences, what types of... Have you done live streaming with conferences? I've done live streaming just in general, you know, with Liz Winstead, which wasn't a conference, but um, it was her live um, comedy special. Okay, so, so kind of a smaller setting, not conference level? Uh, no, I mean, it was at the Cedar and it was sold out, so there's oh. hundreds of people there, but okay. yeah. What kind of equipment do you use for... Yeah, so for that, um, I actually use this, it's kind of a newer camera on the market called the Mevo. And I absolutely loved it. It was a camera that uh, Liz and her staff had invested in before I was even pulled in. And um, for people looking for a very smart, simple, easy to use solution for live streaming video, uh, I would definitely, and I have a whole review about it on my blog. I saw yeah. I'll, I'll, it's I'll plug that for you. Thanks. You're Thanks, Rachel. You're welcome. Quite yeah. um, So, but I love it because it connects directly to your smartphone, and you can direct from it. You know, it's like you can choose a crop. It shoots in 4K, and then you can choose a cropped-in version of that 4K image. Okay. So I was able to, whenever Liz would make a joke and she would have a dramatic pause or something, I could just like, click on her face and like it would really quick go to like a, a close-up of her face and you know so it felt like we had three cameras going but it was just one and the other beautiful thing about it is is that you can set it up and if you put it on autopilot it will and I haven't tried this mode so I'm not 100% vouching for the mode but it looked cool um, you can put it on autopilot and if you're speaking on like a panel it will pick up whoever's speaking just by the way their body language is and um, it'll go to a close-up of that person. Oh so my. like you can take it'll look like you have your own little production studio with you with your Mewo camera. So a yeah. scientific production yeah. studio. Super cool. Getting so, fancy. I loved it. And it worked really great for Liz's um, because all we had to do was uh, I had to buy an iRig uh, converter from Guitar Center uh, just so that I could get the feed out of the audio board and it went directly into my iPhone. So it's like I had all the professional mics right into my iPhone, directed from it. The only thing I would say is that if you are thinking that you're going to get a really close up shot, that's the only disadvantage of the Mevo is that it has to be pretty close. Like we had it within four feet of her for her. <laughs> you know, it was like, Book. yeah, yeah. So, um, if you want to get a close shot at all, it's it's not a, as great for that. So, don't think okay. that you can have it at the back of the room and like really capture our motion. Okay. It'll be like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the Mevo, it was awesome. Loved it. Okay. I'm really practical about being careful with my equipment and yeah. treating it kindly. So, one word is budget. What do you use to protect your equipment when you are on the road? 
I'm not gonna lie, I'm usually producing directing when I'm on the road with the crew, so they have like amazing pelican like cases that are just meant to be banged around and that's usually what they're using. Um, if I'm on the road with any gear by myself, it's usually because I'm teaching a smartphone workshop. So I just have it just pack, packed nicely, you know, cushioned a little bit with something in my, <laughs> in my laptop bag at the time, you know. <laughs> Let's talk about another piece of video equipment that you yeah. actually have in your mm -hmm. hand. Yep. Um, what do you use for on-the-go interviews? Uh, anytime I'm on the go or even if I'm doing just a video blog in my house, you would think since I have uh, lots of professional equipment at my house, I would use that. But actually, I use my iPhone because it has the fastest workflow <laughs> and then I can get it done. And what I do is I just strap it into this wonderful little gorilla pod, um, which is a tripod that has bendy bendy legs that you can, you know, put anywhere, which is great, um, especially if you're at an event or something. Mm -hmm. You can take your phone and wrap it around a high tree and do a time lapse with it mm -hmm. and it just snaps right in there which is awesome mm -hmm. and then the other thing that I absolutely am loving right now um, I think a lot of people miss the boat as far I'm just gonna it's fine you're like what do you do to protect your equipment <laughs> throw it somewhere <laughs> um, I also love this little microphone by Rode um, called a uh, smart lap plus and it uh, plugs directly into your phone and I it's just a little wireless mic and I have an adapter on the end because my iPhone obviously um, has a lightning cable and not a headphone jack so no, no headphones on the iPhone now so but it adapts it was like 10 bucks the adapter so okay. um, the thing I like about this is um, being hardwired into something, I know I don't have to carry batteries, and I know that it's really reliable, and I don't have to worry about Bluetooth or, or you know, cutting out. So um, I don't get as nervous when I'm, you know, doing uh, an interview or something on the run. I mean, I, you know, after my workshops or something like that. Right. If I want to interview someone with, someone with my iPhone. Mm -hmm. I also use these to make Chris's Dapper Chef videos, you know, okay. really easy. But these have great sound and I think they're like 50, 60 bucks and hardwire right in. You might need to get an extender cable because it's not super long. So by the time you get it up someone's shirt, it's like, oh, you have to stand like this close to them. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think it's really, really helpful. And then the other thing that I always think I, well, I learned the hard way is important to take with you as a notebook. And I am not so much like a pink glittery notebook type of person, despite having pinkish hair. Um, but I brought this because this shows and represents a time when I was not prepared. And that's when I was directing the show at Paisley Park for Prince. Um, because I thought we would have walkie talkies and he was like, nope, no walkies. Like he didn't want to complicate it for some reason. And we were just like, we don't, we don't get walkie talkies. And so I ended up um, asking one of the dancers had this notebook sitting there. And I was like, can I use your notebook? And she, and she was like, sure, whatever, just keep it. It's fine. It, you know, I have a pack of them, you know, it cost me a dollar, you know? And I was like, okay, great. And so what I did to direct the shoot, um, is I wrote um, my direction to my camera guys on the paper. And so I would write like, uh, up guitar fret, two drums. You know, like that's because once you get on stage with Prince, like as a camera person, you're kind of a little like, tell me what to do next, you know? And, and so I was just standing on the side of the stage um, and every once in a while my camera guy, Jameson at the time would look up and I would say, rack guitar to crowd, like stand behind the guitar, do a rack focus, and then rack focus so that you can see the crowd. Like he was just looking for ideas and inspiration and, um, you know, feet, pedals from the floor, meaning like pan up. And uh, it was just like the only way that I com could communicate with him because it was so loud in there and yes. there's no other way to do it. So um, I think this to me represents the ability for anyone to think on the fly and just really think on the fly and I, and I always keep a little notebook with me now mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. um, 
and especially if you're gonna do a video blog because you can just write down you don't have to write out a whole script you can just write down like three points that you want to touch on mm -hmm. and that way if it's something you know a lot about already you can just uh, use your bullet points and look right into the camera and talk about your bullet points so it's great I do that not for that necessarily. I do it for the editing piece of it sure. because when I have to write down numbers of where I'm at with mm -hmm. the editing of it, mm -hmm. and say for example, it, it, for me it's creating that habit because the day where I'm actually doing video, you know, for the job, and oh hey, you have to go to a meeting right now, yeah, and you just need to write the number down real quick so mm -hmm. that you can come back to the video and you can remember exactly where you start left off. Sure, because that stuff kind of goes away quickly. Yeah. And, yeah, the, the, I love notebooks. Is notebooks what I'm are great. To say. They are fabulous. <laughs> they are fabulous, and they're only a dollar. There you go. <laughs> so let's talk transferring data. Mm -hmm. And I have SD cards, and I've got two terabyte external hard drives. Yeah. What other tools do you use to back up your footage? I always upload um, client stuff to Vimeo on a private. I have a, a pro account which has a lot of space, um, so that they always have access to it, so that they're not like, hey, <laughs> we lost that file, can you send it to us again? Like, okay. Because then they always have the link to it, and um, you can download directly off of uh, Vimeo, the HD version, um, which is great. And so, and then I just make sure that those are private links for them, so they're not searchable, nobody's finding them, they need right. a password, and that's great. Um, I back up, my more important footage on Dropbox as well and on like we said before I use two different brands of hard drives yes. um, whenever I'm on a shoot I always have two different hard drives with me two different brands dump all the raw footage onto each one and uh, yeah so that way there's a couple different fail saves I also um, have used in the past past and know a lot of people that use I think it's called Crash Plan. It's by a local company, and I think it's still called Crash Plan unless they changed their name. But okay. yeah, yeah. So. That was like five. Yeah. Gotta always <sighs> be ready because it'll be like four years down the road, and the clients like, yes. "Hey, <laughs> do you have this thing?" <laughs> so and I'm like, "What? What? Yeah, I gave that to you two years ago. Sure, I need it again." Yep. And just like labeling those hard drives and knowing yes. where everything is, is super important. Yeah, there, there's a video where Casey Neistat he he talks about how he how he uploads all of his footage, all of his raw footage, and the amount of drives that he has. Yeah, it's crazy. He does the exact opposite of what you do, which I kind of blows my mind. Sixty four terabyte external hard drive. Oh yeah, no, I wouldn't do that because then if it crashes, you're done. Yeah. Mm -mm. That makes me nervous. That makes me really nervous. Yeah. I'd rather lose one project than all my projects. <laughs> That's my philosophy there. Because <laughs> it will fail, you know, like they just will. Nice dad, if you see this, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> so last question, um, it doesn't really touch on video, but at the same exact yeah. time it does. Mm -hmm. Very simple, who are your mentors? Oh man, so many, so many. The number one mentor for me is my mom because she is just this positive, wonderful person who has a genius IQ and, um, you know, told me growing up that I could be anything I wanted to be and the power of that is just amazing, you know. It's like I'm the kid that we weren't rich so I was like wearing the same kind of sweatpants to school every other day. and and being made fun of for the shoes I was wearing. And she would just all the time be like, you are loved and you can be anything you wanna be. So parents, like, just keep that in mind. It's important. Mm -hmm. um, as far as industry goes, my mentors are my peers, I feel like, most of the time. I, one of my best friends, Nick Kessler, is a mentor to me in all ways, shapes, forms. He's currently kicking cancer's butt right now and just is a role model for all things. And then, you know, people that I've worked with for a long time, Seth Perriman, Liz Zilka, and Tom Ferlitti, they're my rocks, and they are always on my crew, audio, grip, grip slash lighting, and branding makeup. So they always have just great words of wisdom, and I love that, mm -hmm. yeah. And we all just learn from each other, and 
I would also say that a great mentor, and I don't know how often people can say this, is actually a competitor of mine. And that's uh, Elizabeth Georgi, who owns Mighty Ore, and which is also a female-owned video company. And we get together and we talk about stuff. And I, I don't know. I just don't see a lot of other competitors doing that. And we look at ourselves, and we've said this many times. Like we, we know our strengths individually, and we want to help empower each other. Mm -hmm. And so I've hired her crew before, you know, because they're out in Denver and. Sometimes I've needed something done, and then she's hired me before to direct stuff in town when she's not in town, and mm -hmm. it's just, it's refreshing, because mm -hmm. we're two completely different companies, and we recognize that, and we recognize the power of women empowering women. That's awesome. Yeah. To find Erica on, you know, the, the web, the interwebs and whatnot, yeah. pewgrainbows.com, I think we've said that probably four times, but it never hurts to say it again. <laughs> And you can find her on Twitter. She's very active on there. Yep. Meet Erica. Meet Erica. Like, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's a lot of fun to follow, and you'll learn a lot from her. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll be giving away tons of uh, freebie tips via email in the next couple weeks. So Somebody just signed up for that yesterday. Yay, good, perfect. Yay. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> and you focus on helping, and you help it, and you help us, help us with the companies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> she said "hump" three times in that sentence, and none of those words were supposed to be "hump." <laughs> so we're humping. They need a second to gather. That's okay. <laughs> oh, I just made up like three new words. Yeah. Humpany and a humpany. I'll stop saying it. I'm sorry. I'm not making it any better. <laughs> I'm dying over here. <laughs> Whoo! Kidding. Okay. Stuart did that to me. That was kind of funny. Okay. All right. Do I look? Am I, am I okay? You're bright red. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. So am I. I'm like, oh my god, why do I wear a scarf? You know? Because I couldn't find my necklace. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> okay, breathe. <laughs>